The following interview was conducted with Professor George Hyde, uh, Dean of the, of the School uh, College of Education for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, October 24th, 2007, on campus. Welcome. Let's tell us a little bit about where you were born, and your early life, and parents and siblings. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that opportunity. I was born in the Northwest in Portland, Oregon. My father was in the military. And uh, within about a year of being born, we moved to Italy. And from Italy, we moved back to Southern California, and then f from there to Hawaii. From Hawaii, we went to back to Southern California, where I graduated from uh, Pepperdine University uh, with a degree in psychology. And I truly think those early moving experiences uh, encouraged me to think about the world uh, as a much larger place than just California or the United States. And from there, I went on to get my doctorate after uh, teaching and uh, working as a psychologist uh, for the government of Guam. Received my doctorate at University of Northern Colorado. Thought I wanted to be a director of a pupil personnel services unit in, say, a large school corporation. Found out that I really enjoyed research. And from there, that kind of, uh, I think, uh, moved my career toward an academic career. My first uh, teaching experience uh, in academia was at Northern Arizona University in the psychology department, and then uh, spent the next 24 years at University of Georgia, where I was a distinguished research professor in uh, educational psychology, special education, and clinical psychology. And then from there, uh, after a stint as an associate dean for research, moved to Purdue University, and have been here for, this is my fifth year, as dean of the College of Education. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, let me back off just a little bit. Tell us a little bit about ca campus life and what the university was like when you were there in Pepperdine. Pepperdine. Did you, uh, did you live on campus or? Very good question. Pepperdine at that time, this was back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, was in what would now be considered the inner city of Los Angeles, uh, just east of Inglewood. And, it, and I went there the year after um, the famous Watts riots. And at that point in time, we lived on campus. It was a small uh, liberal arts college. It was an absolutely wonderful place. But it was very clear that um, kind of the, uh, the, uh, the urban environment was changing rather dramatically. And uh, about two years, three years after I left, they moved the main campus from the kind of um, uh, inner city of Los Angeles out to Malibu, California. And of course, Pepperdine now has this absolutely gorgeous campus out in Malibu overlooking the uh, South Bay and uh, the Pacific coastline. Was the whole, about how large the school was it? When it was, was it only liberal arts? Uh, yeah, at that time, it was only liberal arts, and it had about, I'm thinking probably about 2,300 students. Uh, Pepperdine has grown significantly since then. Uh, they now have a couple of branch graduate campuses, a graduate center in Culver City. They also have a law school down in Orange County, California. Mm -hmm. So it's grown from a small liberal arts college to a rather uh, large private university. Mm -hmm. Okay, and enrollment mm -hmm. has increased over time. Oh, substantially, I I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, now this brings us to Purdue, their career path. And when you came, you said, I'm thrilled to be coming. What excites me about my decision here is there's a sense of excitement about moving and doing something new in the university. So I find myself invigorated by the opportunity to create new opportunities. Very nicely said. And I think well, uh, we might want to start with the anniversary upcoming. Tell us a little bit about the school. Well, the College of Education um, actually is the outgrowth of about a hundred year, one hundred year history. Uh, the first professor of uh, education was hired in 1907, and uh, interestingly enough, he was a professor of um, industrial education. And from that point in time, the education faculty slowly grew. Um, of some interest, uh, particularly in today's context, the first education department was actually in the College of Science. Uh, from College of Science, uh, the Department of Education moved over to what was, has become known as HISI, um, which would be Humanities, Social Sciences, uh, and I'm blocking on it. Education. Education, there you go. Uh, shows you how long I've been here. About 16 years ago, however, uh, the, under the uh, directorship of uh, the Provost uh, Bob Ringel uh, and President Beering, uh, College of Education was created. This was 16 years ago. Bob Kane was the first dean of the what was then designated as the School of Education. 
about three years ago, um, along with some of the other schools on campus, the College of Education renamed itself as a College of Education. So the College of Education actually has a century-old tradition here at Purdue University, but it really is a relatively new college of only 16 years. Mm -hmm. Of some interest, uh, education started at Purdue because the recognition that other universities in this uh, state, both public and private, were doing a good job of training elementary uh, teachers, which we still do, I might add. But Purdue decided to get into the teacher education business uh, so that uh, uh, secondary education professionals could be trained. So Purdue took very seriously the idea of training biology educators, physics educators, chemistry educators, uh, at that time home economics educators, and other secondary uh, teachers. Um, now, of course, we've united all of that so that the College of Education actually has elementary education, but all of the secondary degrees are actually awarded in the content area departments in five other schools or colleges here on campus. I see. So we have about a thousand students currently in the College of Education and about another thousand that are scattered across five other colleges in secondary content areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the strategic plan uh, as it relates to the College of Education mm -hmm. to, to implement the university's plan. Right. The, uh, I uh, originally, when I saw the opportunity uh, uh, posted on the web at that time, of course, uh, to come to uh, Purdue, uh, I looked at the job description and I, I didn't think too much about it, actually. Uh, but then I got a phone call, actually, from a professor here in the College of Education. And he encouraged me to go look at President Jiski, um, his strategic plan that was posted on the web. And I can remember looking at the uh, strategic plan for the university that was posted on the web and sitting back in my chair and going, my goodness, I've never seen anything so ambitious. So that encouraged me to kind of look into what the opportunities might be here at Purdue. Um, eventually came to interview and uh, it was, I remember, an extremely cold, 11 degrees, January day, uh, ice and snow all over the ground. And uh, I remember leaving that interview energized with an incredible sense of the opportunities that existed here at Purdue to do new, different, and collaborative things. There was a sense of energy on campus I've never experienced really in my academic life. Uh, and after becoming dean and coming here, we developed our own College of Education strategic plan. Uh, and it meshed with and uh, complemented, I believe, the university's strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a wonderful process, and I can tell you about five years later now, we've probably accomplished 80%, I think, at least, of the things that we said we wanted to accomplish because of our strategic plan. Very good. Well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. When you came now, you some challenges or uh, something, uh, the changes in whatever that you made in the school? or. What were some of the challenges and the opportunities right. that you just addressed? Right. The, uh, I think the challenges in the College of Education, um, the faculty at that point in time, there had been a school, School of Education, for about 10 years or so. They had had a previous dean, uh, Marilyn Herring was the second dean, and she had led the college through rather significant changes in the teacher preparation program, changed it so that it really was ahead of the curve nationally. Um, students, uh, instead of just taking a collection of uh, classes and then taking student teaching at the end of their uh, academic career, um, had field experiences from day one when they set foot on campus. So that by the time they entered their student teaching, they had had essentially three years of field work experience in the schools. Uh, that was a major overhaul of all of the teacher ed programs here on campus, and she led that effort. But the faculty, I think, felt that perhaps the research agenda needed more attention, and certainly there were opportunities there. And the opportunity that I really saw that excited me was the opportunity to help faculty in the College of Education connect to other faculty and colleges and departments across campus. Um, the, the College of Education is relatively small. Uh, at the time I arrived here, about 60 faculty. We now have 70 plus faculty, thanks to strategic hires. But um, it was not especially well connected to the strengths of Purdue. And I think everybody here would agree, Purdue has marvelous strengths in the liberal arts, engineering, and sciences. And so what I saw as an opportunity and what we actually did through our strategic plan was to connect the College of Education teacher preparation programs to the College of Science, 
to the College of Engineering, College of Technology, and build on those relationships and those strengths of Purdue. And in large part, I think we've accomplished that mm -hmm. mission. Uh, it goes back to yeah. a lot of the collaborative things, which is really a much, mm -hmm. much different and taking place over the last few years. Yes, and I would say that the connection to science, technology, and engineering is very consistent now, and I think that we were a little bit, uh, a little bit ahead of the curve again uh, in uh, fostering programs of teacher preparation in what are called the STEM disciplines. And uh, we have good relationships, and I think we're well respected across campus yeah. for reaching out and forging those relationships. Sure. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about some of your institutes and programs. Right. Um, one, the Ackerman Center for Democratic mm -hmm. Citizenship. I, and one of the reasons I'm addressing these is mm -hmm. when I think of researchers, they'll hear these names, they'll be in place, and right. you can ad address a little bit about them. So if you talk uh, that one, I've got a few others too. Go ahead with that. Sure. The, um, the Ackerman um, uh, Center for Democratic Citizenship actually is an endowed center. Uh, James F. Ackerman, uh, a uh, venture capitalist and entrepreneur in the telecommunications um, uh, uh, environment, um, funded the Ackerman Center and also funded through an endowment the um, James Ackerman Professorship in Democratic Citizenship, which Phil Van Fossen currently holds that, that title and is the director of the Ackerman Center. The Ackerman Center has as its primary mission um, the infusion of understanding of democratic citizenship into the uh, high, middle and high school curriculum, uh, really through the social studies um, curricular efforts. Uh, the center holds workshops, um, particularly in the summer, to help social studies teachers uh, sharpen their skills with regard to uh, um, democratic issues. Uh, there's uh, some wonderful research to show that um, uh, a better understanding of how our system of government works um, can have a positive influence on uh, students once they graduate from high school. Um, in fact, after high school, um, there's rather good evidence to show that high school graduation will increase uh, community involvement um, by uh, the graduates and will also, uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, high school graduates have a higher probability of being involved in the voting process in electing our elected mm -hmm. officials. So we take a knowledge of democratic principles, the Constitution, very seriously and work with social studies teachers to infuse that knowledge in the curriculum. I might also say that the Ackerman Center uh, with Phil Van Fossen's leadership currently um, uh, helps the university, Purdue University, honor the Constitution on Constitution Day. And every year, um, Senator Byrd from West Virginia required all institutions that receive federal funds to honor the Constitution and um, the Ackerman Center helps uh, Purdue do that. And by having a day long very good celebration. Press on that, yeah. Yes, they have. Right. We're good very exhibits. proud of the Ackerman Center. That's right. How about the Gifted Education Resource Institute? The Gifted Education Resource Institute, um, better known as Jerry on and off campus, uh, that'd be G E R I, um, serves uh, the gifted and talented youth both within the state and, uh, and also the faculty have an impact nationally through the research and service and engagement. A um, couple of things about uh, Jerry. One is, is that they offer what are called Saturday, uh, Super Saturday camps, so that they offer a variety of different um, um, educational opportunities for children who are either identified as gifted uh, or are nominated by teachers, as an example. They come here on Saturday to learn about space, the principles of engineering, agriculture. It's really quite an, an incredible um, opportunity for kids uh, with talents uh, or gifted intellectual abilities to kind of gain exposure to things they might not otherwise gain exposure to. Uh, Jerry also offers uh, during the summer a uh, series of institutes uh, for gifted and talented youth. Uh, some of these are, are day, uh, day camps, so to speak. And then uh, there's one that's a residential camp. And of some interest, um, about each year, about 30 students from uh, a um, uh, school in uh, South Korea come to Purdue, and these are exceptionally gifted individuals, uh, students, come to Purdue to take part in uh, this summer program for gifted and talented youth. 
those students all stay in the residence halls. So that's a residence, that's actually a two-week camp. And it's a wonderful um, venue for enriching the lives of gifted uh, high school students in that latter case. But also it's a wonderful opportunity for our graduate students and faculty to do research on these uh, exceptional, uh, exceptionally talented mm -hmm. uh, Do you have an understanding, students. is it the same school all the time or does it vary? Um, the, Just the, the school that we partner with in South Korea is the same school every year. Mm -hmm. But we have other relationships with schools, certainly in the state of Indiana, that draw students into uh, Purdue University. And frankly, we look at it as a wonderful recruitment opportunity. Right. Uh, and we have just more recently established some relationships with um, uh, some folks up in the Chicago area and have tried to draw in some of their students um, in the Chicago area for two purposes, really. One is to give them the opportunity, number one, and number two, so that uh, we can increase the diversity in the summer offerings. Right, that's good. The mm -hmm. reading recovery certainly is one that started as a summer literacy, but that's really... Oh, reading yeah, recovery has yeah. grown substantially just in the, uh, this is my fifth year here, uh, has grown substantially in the sense that reading recovery um, does two, several things. One is, is it, it trains teachers uh, in the principles of reading recovery, but perhaps most importantly, they train the trainers. So what they do is, is that they work with teachers uh, who come here for a year-long residency to become a pr trainer of, uh, in the area of reading recovery. And what reading recovery aims to do is to work with very young children uh, who are experiencing difficulty in learning to read. Now, these are not what we might consider to be learning necessarily learning disabled children. Rather, these are children that may come from backgrounds where there weren't a lot of reading materials in the home, where the parents may speak another language, Whatever the case is, these are young, struggling readers. And there are techniques that reading recovery teachers use to infuse a couple, a couple of points, I suppose, to infuse a love of reading uh, and books uh, for these young students. Second of all, work with them um, in their word recognition skills, ability to sound out words, but most importantly in their development of comprehension as to what they're learning from the, for, from the printed word. The interesting thing is, is that there's very good evidence, I think scientific evidence, which is important in these days, um, that shows that about 80% of the children that go through a reading recovery program uh, go on to become successful readers. Now the other 20% may be children that have serious reading problems that uh, may qualify them for either special education services or continued efforts to help them learn sure. how to read. That's very good. Yeah. That's a good the impact is rather phenomenal when you think that we're training the teachers who then go out and help other teachers. Um, so literally uh, thousands of children have been served both in the state of Indiana and outside the what state. What are the ages of the normally for the children? Are they uh, first one, the, Yeah, one, these, two, are, these are early readers. So okay. we're talking, uh, what, seven, eight, six, seven, eight. Um, right. And these are really the first reading experiences these children have. So, and that's, I think we would all agree in education and in the area of psychology that those are really the critical years. Right. Absolutely. If, right. It's so if you key. come from an environment where reading wasn't exactly facilitated or you were exposed to it, um, uh, those are the years they really need to kind and of... you got to start young. you got to start we, young. Absolutely. Right, yeah. How about the one you may have mentioned, the Center for Research and Engagement in Science and Math, and Mathematics? Yes. And, that's um, a collaborative. That's a collaborative with the College of Science, and we're very proud of that collaboration. About uh, three years ago, um, we recognized then that there was a serious need to bring the College of Education together with the, co with the resources in the College of Science to try and um, uh, really ratchet up our ability to do a good job in preparing science teachers. Now, by science, I mean that in a more generic sense, really talking about math educators, chemistry educators, uh, physics teachers, uh, earth and atmospheric teachers. And so we really wanted to work with the College of Science to build up the science faculty. So we did that through hires, split hires. We would hire a faculty. They'd be 75% on our faculty, 25% on science, or there's various permutations of that. Most importantly, working with Jeff Vitter, who's, who was and is the current dean of science, uh, we developed this Center for Research and Engagement in Science and Mathematics Education, and we refer to that as CRESME. Um, and what we did was each one of us, each college, uh, hired a co-director with the idea that the College of Education co-director would be working to uh, enhance, improve, study, do research on, attract federal funding for um, kind of K through 12 
uh, science education. So that would be helping elementary teachers develop science curricula, middle school and high school uh, teachers. The College of Science side, their co-director, uh, it was thought would have um, interest in doing research and attracting federal funds and, and um, working with faculty in curricular revisions to help students in higher education or in the post-secondary area learn the principles of science. Uh, Eric Riggs is the current uh, College of Science uh, co-director. He came here just last year from uh, San Diego State University. He's an earth and atmospheric scientist. And then uh, our, the College of Education hired John Staver from Kansas State University. And John Staver is a former president of one of the National Science Teacher Associations and most recently uh, will be, has been appointed a, a future editor of the Journal of Science Teaching. Yeah. So this center was formally launched, like I say, a couple of years ago. We brought in Carl Wyman, who was a, uh, he's a Nobel laureate in physics, and he feels very strongly about the importance of validating science teaching practices. So he came here for a day, we flew him in um, on the Purdue jet, uh, from University of Colorado and he gave a presentation about how he has in his own laboratory studied how they can improve uh, instruction in physics and so uh, we can't think of a better way to kick off uh, right. the creation of this center than to bring in a Nobel laureate to talk about right. the importance of science education. Yeah. Are, you, is it, are you having people from the state that come in or is it just people here at Purdue that will be able to work on right. this? Well, we we're, we're recruiting. We already have mm -hmm. uh, a number of affiliated faculty with uh, Cresme um, uh, who are on campus. Now, these are faculty that might be in chemistry or sure. in, in other, other colleges and other departments. They're affiliated with Cresme and they're trying to work together to form groups that may pursue uh, external funding. Um, there's also faculty external to uh, Purdue that are, will likely affiliate with, uh, with the center. Yeah. So we really look at this as perhaps a good way to think about it is as a hub for science education at Purdue, which could include Purdue faculty, Purdue students, but also, also others sorry, from other right. places. That sounds good. Right. Then you've got, one thing that's fairly new is that exchange program. I know you had some people from the Netherlands that came. How did we that have come had, I, yeah. I really appreciate your mentioning that. We have had, uh, since I first came here, we, when I first came here, we had three study abroad programs. We now have seven study abroad programs of one kind or another. A um, couple of points about the College of Education study abroad programs is that um, most of our study abroad programs are integrated into our curriculum so that um, we have a block, what's called a block and gate system. You have to take a certain number of courses in a required sequence and um, then you have to pass certain criteria to move to the next block of courses. What we've done is, is that we have created some study abroad programs that during the summer you can actually take some of those block courses in the summer either to get ahead in your curriculum or to catch up in your curriculum. And currently just some of the ones we have would be uh, in Honduras where students actually go down there and they go to a private school. They spend uh, several weeks there and they actually, the, the instruction is done in English but they actually, the students actually live in a home uh, where native Spanish speakers live, and this is in Honduras. Great experience. We have another one in South Africa where the students go and take their um, uh, educational psychology class and a course in special education, and they actually uh, do some field work uh, in a uh, special education classroom in South Africa vastly different experience than you would find here. Um, I would last, imagine. Last year we had about 18 students that went and it was a great experience and the good thing is at the end of the trip they all have an opportunity to go to Kroger, uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa which is truly a really a That's game right preserve. Here. Right. And then, it's worth uh, waiting for. <laughs> it's worth waiting for, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and then we have another one in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, that is kind of geared toward our social studies uh, sequence of courses and students. And that one's always very popular. We ha are launching one this year in New Delhi, India. Uh, students will be able to go there and take some of our required courses. We also have, now those were all at the undergraduate level. We have some at the graduate level one in particular would be an exchange program we have with Fontys University in the Netherlands. And that was uh, initiated, launched is a better word, by Jean Peterson, who is a faculty member in uh, school counseling. 
and she forged a relationship with faculty at Fontes University in the Netherlands. Uh, our graduate students in school counseling go over there. They spend several weeks um, working with the faculty there, uh, living in the homes of um, people at the university community, uh, and then they also have seminars learning about how counseling is taught and practiced in, uh, in mm -hmm. the Netherlands and Europe. And then when their students come here, and faculty come here. It's it's the river, it's the uh, similar process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very successful, and we're very proud of that okay. one. How long do these uh, p could it be for a semester, or is it is it vary? Some of the, well, it varies. Okay. Uh, most of the study abroad experiences are two to three weeks long. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're actually now beginning to explore possibly setting up some opportunities for students to go do their student teaching, which might be a semester long sure. in some of these places. Um, Honduras would be a good one as an example, um, and, um, and perhaps South Africa yeah, as well. That would be very good. Yes. Um, the Jane Adams and Stanley Faculty Chair in Literacy, that's and uh, gaining two endowed professorships right. will improve the education of future teachers as well as enhance the image of both the co college and Purdue as a whole. It's right. fairly new. We, um, when I, when I How first, did that come about? Well, that's a, a, there's a good story to that, like I think there's all good stories uh, <laughs> that I can tell. Good. Uh, when I first got here, we had uh, two endowed professorships, two endowed slash named professorships. Uh, one was the uh, James F. Ackerman Endowed Professorship in Democratic Citizenship, and the other one was a named professorship uh, in honor of Robert Kane, our, our founding dean. Um, since then, we have actually added four more endowed professorships, which were part of our development strategic plan, and uh, we did that over a four-year period, and uh, we're very proud of that. One of those endowed professorships is the Gene Adamson Family Chair in, in Literacy. Um, the Dollins family, um, uh, Ron Dollins and Susie Dollins, um, they live in Indiana uh, and certainly in Indianapolis, but um, they provided the endowment for this. The, the honor is to honor Susie Dollins' mother, who was one of seven siblings, all of whom became educators in the state of Indiana. And this is back in a time uh, when uh, education was not something everybody did. Sure. So it was really quite an honor to, um, uh, to her mother's name and memory. But it also is important to us because it um, allowed us to award this endowed professorship to um, Mary Beth Schmidt, who has been the director of our reading recovery program. And Mary Beth Schmidt, I think, epitomizes the uh, outstanding faculty we have here because not only has she been a wonderful scholar and done some great research, but she engages in uh, improving the clinical practice of reading specialists throughout the nation, but most importantly uh, here in the state of Indiana. So um, it was a wonderful way to honor an educator and uh, a family that was committed to education, and it's a wonderful way for us to honor the contribution to Mary Beth Schmidt. Right. It's a perfect match. It, it is, clicked, right. and we, yeah. Were, yeah. we were so delighted for that. Yeah. Um, diversity within the college, is that, right. how is that comment, a couple of comments on that? Yeah, it's interesting. The, the College of Education, um, we have the College of Education here, and the College of Education actually has only three undergraduate programs. One is elementary education, second is social studies education, and the third one is special education. All other teacher education students are enrolled in five other colleges. They may be in biology, they may be in physics or agriculture, um, but they also go through our pedagogy courses and teacher preparation courses as part of them receiving their degree in, um, in their content area. Uh, but getting back to the issue of diversity, the College of Education, particularly in relation to, say, training or preparing elementary teachers, we are one of about 30 or 40 teacher preparation institutions in the state. Hmm. Many people would think that it would be just, you know, Purdue University, uh, University of uh, Indianapolis, perhaps, IU, Ball State, uh, Indiana State, but it turns out there's there's probably close to 40 teacher preparation institutions in this state. So part of the challenge with our undergraduate diversity is, in, is encouraging students to think of Purdue as the place they want to become right. or get their teacher training, rather than just staying in the neighborhood, so to speak, and going to IU Fort Wayne or, um, um, or say, Ball State. 
So we have some challenges in recruiting. Our diversity at our undergraduate level in the College of Education is right around 4 to 5 percent. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at our graduate enrollments in diversity, um, we are actually at about 13 or 14 percent um, of underrepresented populations in our graduate program. So we're actually doing quite well at the graduate level because students want to come to Purdue to get their PhD sure. or their master's degree. We have launched, uh, because of our concerns at the undergraduate level though, we hired Lynette Flagg, who is a uh, director of our diversity initiatives. And Lynette is within the school. Uh, within the school, mm -hmm. college. college. And um, she specifically is charged with, and she's extremely creative, so we're thrilled to have her, with forging relationships with school corporations, school districts, uh, and students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and in fact, she's been very instrumental in us reaching out to some school, school districts in uh, South Chicago. So Good. we're starting to forge those relationships uh, in the hopes that we can draw in some of those students to Purdue to become teachers. Sure. Uh, because we have a strong commitment for diversity in the sense that we want to prepare teachers that look like, sound like, and understand the students Right. they're working with. Right, exactly. What about the uh, career opportunities for the students and how is the field looking today for them? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the field of education, uh, actually there's a, there's a very well recognized shortage right now in what are called the STEM discipline teachers. That would be science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and all of the kind of sub-disciplines there. Um, and in fact, there's also a recognition that the shortage is such that at the middle school and high school level, a number of secondary courses, say in mathematics, are taught by teachers out of area. To give you an example, a biology teacher may be teaching biology or chemistry, let's say a chemistry teacher, but say the mathematics teacher leaves. There's such a shortage of mathematics teachers in this country that the principal may go to the biology teacher or chemistry teacher and say, you need to teach my middle school algebra. Well, they probably can, but that's not their focus. Content area. Content area. Right. So um, we have a shortage of STEM teachers nationally, but we also have currently uh, many teachers teaching out of area. Uh, a number of things contributed to this. One is, is that um, going into teaching science, as an example, is not uh, viewed as a uh, as prestigious career option for a graduate in biology as it might be to go get their PhD. So we feel that a lot of students are kind of uh, siphoned off to pursue graduate work or scientific work which is terrific but um, the number of people that want to become secondary say science teachers is just not great. So we have kind of a recruitment problem but we also have um, this is secondary and elementary level we are going to have a huge number of teachers retiring in this country in the next five years. The um, well-established baby boomer generation, those that went into teaching are going to be retiring in the next five years, five to eight years. That's a serious problem if you couple it with a shortage already in some areas. Right. So we here are preparing elementary teachers and, and all the other specialties. Um, of some interest, in the state of Indiana, we actually have an oversupply right now of elementary teachers. So they have to work hard to get a, a good job. But if they would be willing to move to growth states, Arizona, Florida, Texas, they could get a job tomorrow. In fact, Florida, Texas, Arizona, and other states actively recruit here at Purdue and often will give signing bonuses, pay for moving expenses, uh, but what we found is rather interesting and revealing to me. Midwestern students don't want to leave the Midwest. They want to go back and they want to teach in the school district where their parents live or where they grew up. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's really a national shortage in teachers in this state in particular. There's an oversupply right now of elementary teachers and actually social studies teachers. 
but almost all other discipline are uh, areas of critical need, yeah. from special ed to math ed. That's a real big challenge. It is yeah, a big challenge. Right. Maybe this will help. I think I read somewhere, you have this professional development day that for students that you started. That sounds like a good idea. Yes, absolutely. And this professional development day, all of our student teachers um, who are out there, and, and we prepare each year about 400 students go through student teaching. And you can imagine the coordination that takes place trying to get all of those students into classrooms with supervising teachers and so on. Um, we bring them back. Uh, we put them through a day of professional development where different speakers talk about what it means to become a teacher, um, how to manage your classroom, what were some of the challenges you had in your student teaching, uh, what were some of the things to watch out for, how can you work with your mentor teacher when you do take a job. Uh, it's really a terrific day, I think, and it's really intended to be a culminating experience to the four years of teacher preparation that they've had and then the six to eight to ten to twelve weeks of student teaching that they've completed. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, we just received the latest results of our um, uh, student of our students who have graduated and gone on uh, to take jobs and 95 percent of them are thrilled to death with the preparation that they had here and I think that's a real tribute to Marilyn Herring um, some seven or eight years ago starting to reform the teacher education program mm -hmm. here at Purdue. Uh, they're very well prepared. The professional development, is that just for the seniors or uh, all of doesn't it could be sophomores? It's mainly for the seniors and okay. whatnot. Now we do have other educational experiences uh, for students as they move through the program and those are planned uh, to be relevant to the set of courses that they're having uh, at that particular okay. time. As at that level or whatever they're right. at then. Right. One of the new ones you've got is that on track, that pilot program. With yes. Uh, Sunny Sign to come to tell us a little bit about that sounds sort of challenging. The on track program is for students that are kind of struggling and these could be upper elementary students or um, th the point though is to get our graduate students out there working in partnership with communities, um, community groups, to work with students after time to, quote, get these students on track. And it's really working quite well. Um, it, the genesis of that program um, really kind of evolved out of the school counseling program and the gifted education program. And um, the idea is to target students in schools of high need. So these may be students where there's actually a 60% turnover year to year in the students that are there. So a hmm. school, the entire school or a class may turn over 60%. So in the old days uh, when I went to school, you pretty much moved through third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade with pretty much the same cohort of kids because people didn't move that much. Well, nowadays the turnover could be, as I said, 60 or even 80% uh, from year to year. And sometimes students get lost in that shuffle. Uh, they come in at mid-year, they leave at the end of the year, and so it's easy for some students to kind What's of What sort of are you track. talking about turnover? What do you mean by turnover? Student um, turnover. So say they, you take 30 students in, say, fourth grade. Okay only maybe 20 percent, 30 percent of those same students will be in that same school next year in the next grade. Do they leave? They leave, uh, they For drop one. out of school. It, so the turnover is all sort of right. Family may leave? Or family that, may leave, um, that's absolutely. Interesting. Hmm. It's a huge problem in education right now um, because, you know, it's if you go to... The, the children. Well, it's very difficult for yeah. the children, and absolutely. And the teachers as well. And the teachers as well. Uh, from the teacher's standpoint, it's a little bit of a challenge because nowadays, uh, with all of this focus on testing, um, there is encouragement to start evaluating teachers on how well their students do on standardized tests. The problem is that they may have inherited a class that is 70% new kids and all of a sudden they're supposed to have a positive impact on the test scores from the previous year. We might not even have the test scores from the previous year. So you can't compare the test scores from say third grade to fourth grade because right. it's different kids. That's right, that is a challenge. Right, it is yeah. a huge challenge right, right. now. Yes. One, you, uh, you've got a graduate student educational research symposium which uh, uh, attending this allows the community to learn about what the educators of tomorrow are focusing on. Right. Good thing. Well, tell let me tell you a little bit that. about that. Yeah. The, uh, when I, when I, five years ago when I arrived, uh, what I found was that our graduate student numbers actually were down a little bit. Uh, our faculty didn't feel that we were supporting our graduate students in the way that we should. 
Well, this is a Research One institution in the sense that um, it is part of our land grant mission to be turning out and uh, conducting research and then turning out the leaders in our fields for the next generation. Uh, so we instituted um, some efforts to try and better support our PhD students in particular, encourage our faculty to uh, pursue federal funding, which they have done, and uh, in that context we wanted to provide a, a safe experience, so to speak, for our students to actually present their research so that they could, number one, learn how to present their research to a professional gathering. Sure. Second of all, get feedback on that presentation so that when they went out into the greater world to present their research at professional meetings and gatherings and conferences, they would feel comfortable in that role. So our Associate Dean for Research, uh, Jeff Gilger, working with our Associate Dean for um, um, uh, Learning and Engagement, uh, developed a graduate student research symposium. And really what it is is it's a way to celebrate all of the research that's being done in education um, by having posters like you would have at a conference, by having invited speakers, uh, by asking students to make oral presentations about their research, and then giving them feedback and awards. Uh, so it's kind of a nice way to have a mini uh, conference on campus on education-related research. So it's not just the College of Education students. These could be doctoral students, say, in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences who are working with high school students, perhaps, on uh, a, an experimental project to help them learn more about uh, environmental uh, technology, for that matter. So it really has provided a wonderful forum for students and faculty, actually, to work together to present their research in and a safe environment. And a collaborative thing, too. Is it's another opportunity for that. That's it is. Very Absolutely. Good. All right. How about, you're talking about awards, the Crystal Apple Awards, right. which, which started uh, some started, years ago. Started some years ago. Uh, Marilyn Herring started the Crystal Apple Awards, I believe, um, as a kind of a complimentary way of honoring those um, who were presented with the community, um, um, blocking on the name, the, the awards, the, awards, the sure. I want to say Golden Apple, but um, but, but anyway, so Marilyn Herring uh, developed these um, Crystal Apple Awards, and basically they're given to local educators that um, have distinguished themselves in one way or another to, um, in the field of education. And um, we, haven't, um, we haven't actually awarded those Crystal Apple Awards for two years now. We're retooling the Crystal Apple Award so that the selection criteria uh, are going to more accurately reflect some of the new demands that we now have on teachers. So uh, we're kind of retooling the, gold, the uh, crystal uh, apple. There's a nice oil. quote, everyone can remember a teacher who has influenced their lives. Uh, yes. That's a quote. And that, that applies to so many, in many occasions. I think that's just a really, and people say that all the time when they, they come do. back alums, I remember you, you know, and it's, that's the neatest thing going. It is the neatest thing, and I think that that's one of the reasons that I was attracted to education. I actually ended up um, teaching elementary school for two years to help get me through my graduate program, and that convinced me that education is important. Yeah. Not only seeing the look on the children's face, but I remember very seriously uh, Mr. Beale and my sixth grade teacher, he was a wonderful guy, he pushed everybody, and, uh, but also made you feel valued as a learner, and I think that's very true. It, it's, it has a lasting thing. On right, that. and the Crystal Apple Awards, I think, are a nice way to recognize uh, teachers that have had that kind of impact. Is it only, but it's only for this county, isn't it, for Tippecanoe, is that? Uh, it no, now, the, um, could be now the Crystal Apple Awards are College of Education, typically they're alums, not necessarily, but then the community has that's its Golden one. Apple that's Awards, right. and that's only tip, Greater Tippecanoe. But so the Crystal we, could be somebody within the state, or yes, it could be, absolutely. Uh, could be somebody not living in here, but uh, right. who's nominated for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we have, the college has its Crystal Apple Awards, community yeah, has the Golden Apple Awards. The other one's been going for, for quite a while. Right. Absolutely, and we're very proud of the fact that a number of our graduates have won the yeah, Golden Apple Award, which good. is a community <laughs> one. Uh, honors and awards. Now, a couple things. The 2002, you got the Senior Scientist Award from the American Psychological yes. Association, but that honorary doctorate at the university, and I'm going to draw a blank. Yeah, um, I have the, but I'm I'm not very good on quotes. So uh -huh. tell us a little bit about that and your trip over there, if you can. Well, I will. Um, it's always nice to receive some recognition for what you've done. But but in back in 1986, I uh, um, 
completed a Fulbright fellowship in child neuropsychology. My, my research area focuses in on trying to understand how brains grow and differentiate in areas that are important to learning to read. And in 1986, I uh, had a Fulbright uh, in Finland and at the University of Uvescula. And it's about four hours by train north of Helsinki. So it's just about three hours below the Arctic Circle. And it truly turned out to be one of the best experiences I've ever had. I still, what, 21 years later now, have a relationship with the professor there that I worked with back then. And um, in fact, um, I've had several students go back over there on either Fulbrights or on fellowships of one kind or another. So I've had a long-term relationship with, um, with, this school. with this school, particularly Heike Lutonen, who's a professor and a distinguished professor there. And um, back in several years ago, they um, brought in some faculty from around the world that had had long-term relationships with the University of Uvescula and recognized their scientific contributions and collaborations by awarding an honorary doctorate. And I must tell you, it was a very formal affair. Um, the rector of the university and the president of the university, um, actually you would come up and they had a symphony playing. They would read out your name and um, you would go up there and you would, you would bow down in front of them and they would put a uh, top hat on your head. And uh, yes, I, it's my first top hat. And then you would straighten up and you would put your hands out like this and they would give you a sword. It was a, a sword. <laughs> so, and you would take the sword and go back and it was uh, to represent cutting through knowledge to discover new things is the representation. Uh, but it was very, very formal. Everybody is dra dressed in their uh, tuxes with tails and uh, top hats. It was a very, very formal affair. And needless to say, I could bring the top hat back on the airplane, but I couldn't bring the sword back. The sword is for you. They yes, the sword is for me. Okay. I have a sword at home that was given to me as part of this honorary doctorate, and it was shipped back. <laughs> So, <laughs> security would not go through. No, <laughs> but and I've worn the top hat on a couple of uh, graduation ceremonies here, and it always gets a lot of attention because nobody's wearing top hats. <laughs> right, I know that. Oh, you also got a distinguished alumni award from Pepperdine, and also the University of Northern Arizona. That's mm -hmm. kind of nice. Mm -hmm. and those were, I think, just recognition of the fact that um, I graduated from those institutions, and then. Um, went on to have a, a, a really wonderful, uh, but wonderful not, career in research. But it's nice to be recognized and to go back and, and see things and things like yes, that. Yes, it started. is. It really is. And then I you got it. the International Reading Association Distinguished Award, too. Right. Uh, many years ago, um, we realized that, or I realized that, that the research in the neurobiological basis of understanding how the brain works was galloping ahead of clinical practice. Uh, we were engaged in trying to help people learn how to read in ways that really was not based on the good principles of science as we knew it at that time. So uh, we re actually wrote an article that integrated what we knew about the neurological basis and developmental basis of reading as it related to reading instruction and uh, suggested ways that you could, uh, you could have a better effect in helping children learn to read based on what we knew about how the brain works. And that article was recognized as, um, as having a significant impact at that time in changing the way people thought about, uh, about reading and, and reading difficulties. And how they could improve if they know that the balance there, then right. something else that needs to be looked at, what might be the cause, the cause and effect of it. Right, and, Not, and, there's a, and the, one of the other things is, is that I think educators sometimes forget that there's a natural distribution to all abilities including reading abilities. Most people can learn to become fluent readers, but there's a small subset of persons, children, uh, that have a very significant difficulty learning to read, even when they have good opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it was that population I was very concerned about. Yeah, very good. How about uh, an outstanding event in your life? Anything come to mind on that? Outstanding event? Probably coming to Purdue. Oh. <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, I um, spent uh, 24 years at the University of Georgia really uh, engaged uh, in very serious research effort that was funded by the National Institutes of Health for, for many years and, uh, and private foundations and really trying to understand better how learning takes place and how it interacts with kind of genetic and environmental and uh, developmental factors. 
And, but then having administrative opportunities to create and foster programs that made use of research and best practices. Coming to Purdue, Purdue really helped me understand at a larger level um, how institutions of higher education can truly have an impact not just on the students that we have here but can have a broader influence on the students who are impacted, in, in particular to education, who are impacted from our graduates. So coming here and helping the faculty construct programs that are exemplary really has such an incredible diffuse effect. Uh, I was attracted to the opportunity to have some influence on that. Yeah, that's very good. And it's been terrific being here. And now you're going to be, uh, you're leaving, right? I'm leaving. Yes. <laughs> Having said that, yes, no, that's I right. knew you were moving on, and I yeah. appreciate the opportunity. Any yeah. questions that uh, you'd like to ask that were not asked, or any closing comments uh, you'd like to make or share? Uh, I, I think, I don't have any questions necessarily, but okay. I think one of the things that really does strike me is that um, I think on the national landscape, there are um, permutations to how we have gone about traditionally teaching. I think there are these permutations are taking place. Uh, in some places, they're called charter schools. In some places, they're called private schools. Uh, there's a variety of different exper experiments, I think, happening naturally now in education. And I can't help but think that the Chain, the rate of change is going to accelerate in the expectations people have for public education. Um, but linked to that is, I think, an important opportunity for universities and colleges of education to change as rapidly to meet those natural experiments that are occurring. That are going on. Yes, I think the expectations for public education are, have never been higher and our ability to do it more effectively and in scientifically sound ways uh, is increasingly more challenging. And I think Purdue's College of Education and other colleges of education that I'm familiar with are well positioned to be adaptable to these changes. But it's, uh, it's both an exciting, exhilarating, and uh, a little bit worrisome times because you don't know what the future is going to look right. like. But, but we're well positioned here at Purdue very to meet good. that challenge, I very think. Good. I want to thank you very much for your opportunity to sure. interview, and I want to wish you the best of luck, and I'm sure you'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Okay. I certainly will. Thank My you. wife and children will be here oh. through May, so oh. I'll be back here. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. You that bet. concludes. Thank you.